Um, now for something completely different than the past two talks. So um, I'm going to start with a basic claim. Multimodal evidence is a good thing. This is widely accepted uh, amongst philosophers of science that multimodal evidence is a good thing. And by multimodal evidence, what I mean is a collection of multiple lines of evidence where each line comes from more or less independent experiments and observations. Some of the arguments that have been offered in favor of this um, are things like the variety of evidence thesis, which, uh, for example, Claude Carimor has defended, um, that more varied evidence for a hypothesis makes it better confirmed than um, if the evidence all comes from one type of observation or experiment. Uh, other arguments appeal to the notion of robustness, um, which is quite popular in philosophy of science nowadays, which is that um, robust experimental results uh, come from this multimodal evidence, which allows you to control more for the influence of systematic errors, for example. Um, another type of argument argues that you know, multimodal evidence can allow you to break local underdetermination between hypotheses. So just for a historical example, while um, you know, to exclude Ptolemaic uh, astronomy, you could use the phases of Venus, but to break the local underdetermination between Tychonic and Copernican, uh, uh, yeah, like the uh, Tychonic or Copernican system, you need a parallax, right? So again, you need a multimodal evidence. Um, it's not just that it's a good thing. Sometimes, in some scientific contexts, multimodal evidence is also considered a necessary thing. And the philosophers of science who've worked on this um, have mostly come from the life sciences. So, uh, for example, in biology, uh, there's uh, like system biology, there's Maureen O'Malley who's argued for this, Mitchell and Gronenborn in um, uh, molecular biology. There's also in archaeology, people argue that you need triangulation uh, to you know, make progress on certain scientific questions. And I think probably everybody in this room will agree that when it comes to cosmology and astrophysics, you'd probably need multimodal evidence to actually make progress on certain research questions. The fact that you're trying to reconstruct the evolution of the universe on the larger scales over 13.8 billion years um, seems to imply that one kind of observation is not really going to do the trick, right? And so I'm generally sympathetic to these arguments, and I think they're right. But I do think that there's an important sort of assumption or question that lingers in the background um, that I want to focus on today. Um, specifically, a very basic one, how do you get multimodal evidence, right? And, you know, at first you might think that this is a trivial question, right? Multimodal evidence, I mean, the name says it all, right? You just run different kinds of experiments and observations and that's how you get multimodal evidence. But the problem is that, you know, um, there's a Dutch poem that says between dream and action, there's laws and practical constraints. Maybe Jaco knows it. <laughs> Elschot, no? Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, but, but the, basic, the basic idea is that even though we might want to run like a gazillion number of observations and experiments, as, we, as we've seen from the previous talk, there's practical limitations. There's money, there's know-how, there's uh, time constraints, and so, Scientists cannot run uh, every single experiment that they might want to do. And so then we get confronted with the fact that choices have to be made, right? There have to be choice, choices have to be made about which experiments are going to be run. And so that's the question I want to take up today. How do scientists justify their preferences for running one kind of experiment or for using one kind of method over another? It could also be one set of methods, right, over another. And so what I'm going to do today is I think I'm going, to, I'm going to try to lay out two kinds of general structures by which that uh, justification can happen or that can be used to construct that kind of justification. I'm going to uh, exp um, sort of lay out one which I call target driven first, which I think is very common, uh, for example, in biology, etc. But then I'm also going to um, lay out a second one which I call method driven um, and which I think is more prevalent in uh, cases of dark matter and dark energy. And I hope that by illuminating the second one, um, we can also raise some new questions about the nature of evidence in astrophysics and cosmology and how to interpret evidence. So this is the plan for today. Um, I'm going to start by giving some terminological clarification. Then I'm going to like lay out the two kinds of logic, the target-driven and the method-driven one. Um, by the way, just, you know, preliminary. Logic here means just a general schema that can be implemented in different ways. I'm not talking about like propositional and predicate logic, you know, just so we're clear on that. I'll illustrate the method-driven logic with a case from astroparticle physics, since this is a workshop on evidence in astrophysics, uh, and then I'll come to a quick conclusion. 
All right, so terminology. Especially for the philosophers in the room, some of the terms that I'm going to use have a lot of baggage attached to them. So I'm just going to um, give you the definition or sort of like the way I'm understanding them for the purposes of this talk. Uh, and I, I'm well aware that I'm ignoring a bunch of literature here and I'm just like sidetracking that for right now. So the first one is a method. Um, by method, I don't mean anything like a unity of science method, like Mill's methods or like hypothetical deductivism from the logical positivists. Um, instead, by method, I mean any activity that generates empirical evidence where that activity can be applied in various research contexts and to various targets. So let me unpack. The use of the term activity in the definition is purposefully vague because uh, methods span a wide range of scientific practices, right? It goes from uh, radiometric dating, using an accelerator to search for new particles, using fMRI to map regions of the brain, conduct randomized clinical trials in medicine. And so there's a wide range of like activities on scales and across scales and disciplines that all fall under what I understand as method. But regardless of the specifics of the protocol, a method should be applicable to various research contexts and to various target systems, even though you know, it seems tied to just one targeting practice. Um, so for example, the methods that are used to analyze the cosmic microwave background data could in principle be applied elsewhere, even though we only have one CMD to observe. And the goal of the types of methods under consideration here um, is to generate empirical evidence. So I'm setting aside mathematical methods uh, for the, for today. Uh, and so to generate empirical data that can be used as evidence, um, whether or not that data is good, uh, depends on how the method was applied and how the data processing happened. So the fact that you use a scientific method is not a guarantee for success, right? Method is not, um, a success term here. Second concept that I want to, uh, clarify is that of a target system or a target. I'm going to use the two interchangeably. Um, a target T is that system in the world about which a scientist's research aims to generate knowledge, specifically to explore and model the features and causal interactions of that target. At first sight, this might again strike you a little bit as uh, trivial or circular. Wouldn't a scientist already know what she's invest only know what she's investigating after she has finished her investigation? But of course, that circularity is only apparent, right? It is true that often um, some definition of the target needs to be accepted before an investigation of that target can commence. So for example, particle physicist already had a description of the Higgs boson long before it was actually detected. Um, but uh, of course, that description can be minimal and your application or investigation of a method can reveal new things about that target, right? So that's what I mean by target. Let me give you an example to sort of uh, illustrate these two terms. So this is a neutron. Um, and so for some investigations, the target of the investigation is the neutron. That's described by particle physics. Um, it includes the fact that it's made up of an up quark and two down quarks, and that it has mass and a magnetic moment, et cetera. Part of that description is also that free neutrons can undergo beta decay, in which a neutron decays into a proton, an antineutrino, and an electron. And um, this, uh, the fact that a neutron uh, undergoes beta decay raises the question about the lifetime of the neutron, right? And so using the very minimal and rough description of the neutron that I've given you, um, different methods can be applied to measure that lifetime. Um, so here's two GIFs that sort of like illustrate the, uh, the different kinds of methods. Um, so uh, on the left, you have, yeah, left for you. On the left, you have um, bottle experiments, bottle. Basically, they trap neutrons in a gravitomagnetic tra uh, trap, and um, they, uh, you know, leave them there for a while and then count after a certain period of time how many neutrons are still there. And that gives you a way to estimate the lifetime of the neutron. On the right, you have called what are called beam experiments, in which you have a focused beam of neutrons, and then the decay products along the beam line are counted. And so these two use different features of the neutron, you know, that are as it is described by particle physics, to measure the same thing, the neutron lifetime. And um, just to couple back to the introduction, if the two were to agree, that might give you reason to believe that you have a good estimate of the neutron lifetime because the two methods are subject to different kind of systematic errors, for example. Spoiler alert, the physicist in the room might know the two don't agree, but I'm not going to talk about that. But it's, it's an interesting thing that's living out there. All right, so far for the terminolog 
terminological clarification. Now let me return to the main question at hand, namely how have physicists justified the use of different methods in the past and how can they do that, right? For the neutron lifetime experiments, I uh, submit that this is true what, uh, through what I call a target-driven logic. Um, and here's the general schema first and then I can implement it. Um, so it starts with, given a target system T with, with known features A and B, then you have method one uses features A of T to uncover potential new feature X. Method two uses feature B of T to uncover potential new feature X. Method three uses feature uh, C of T to uncover potential new feature X. And then the conclusion, since methods one and two use features that T is known to have, and method three uses a feature that T is not known to have, the preferred methods to uncover potential new feature X will be methods one and two, while method three will be left out of consideration for now. Why do I call this target driven? Because the justification for the method choice is appealing to the pre-existing knowledge or model of the target that's under investigation, right? So to illustrate it with the neutron example, um, given the neutron, which decays through beta decay, which has a mass and a magnetic moment, and a radius of approximately, uh, of the order of 10 to the minus 15 meters, Model experiments trap neutrons through their mass and magnetic moment and count beta decay products at various time intervals to measure the neutron lifetime. Um, beam experiments use a focused neutron beam and count the beta decay products along the beam to measure the neutron lifetime. And optical microscopy uses a minimal resolution of the order of 10 to the minus 7 meters to magnify optical features of small objects. Since bottle, um, since bottle and beam experiments use features that neutrons are known to have, both can be used to measure the neutron lifetime. Optical microscopy uses length scales much larger than the size of a neutron and can therefore not be used to determine an individual neutron's properties. So you see here, I mean, I know the example of optical micro microscopy is very much contrived, um, but I hope that it sort of conveys the structure of a target-driven logic. Methods are selected or justified based on the pre-existing knowledge of the target and on whether or not the target is known to have features that the method can latch onto to function effectively. Okay. So, so far so good. I hope the target-driven logic seems like a reasonable way uh, or a reasonable strategy to justify the choices of certain methods over others. But there's a problem. The problem is that the target-driven logic is not always available. In fact, in cosmology and certain branches of astrophysics, it is hardly, it's like some, for some targets, it's hardly ever the case that one can appeal to the target-driven logic because not enough is known about the target to appeal to in the justification. So this XKCD comic, uh, which I think a lot of you have seen before, uh, sums up the situation pretty well, right? Baryonic matter is 5% of the total energy of the d density of the universe today. Um, and that constitutes everything we know, everything we see, all the atoms in your body and in our galaxy, all the stars and dust and planets within and outside of our solar system. And for the other 95%, we have no freaking idea, right? That's a problem. Um, it's 26% dark matter and 69% dark energy. And for neither one of those, we have a clear idea about what they are. And though we have very good reason to believe that they are in fact there, right? So consider, for example, um, dark energy. Um, which is, you know, what is responsible for the accelerating expansion of the universe. Uh, in the early 2000s, there was a task force of 20 or so physicists who were tasked with determining, you know, what the next experiment should be to uncover the nature of dark energy. And here's what they wrote in the introduction. Although there is currently conclusive evidence, uh, observational evidence, for the existence of dark energy, we know very little about its basic properties. It is not at present possible, even with the latest results from ground and space observations, to determine whether a cosmological constant, a dynamical fluid, or a modification of general rel relativity is the correct explanation. We cannot yet even say whether dark energy evolves with time. And in the last 13 years, not that much has changed since 2006, right? We still don't know whether it evolves with time or not and what exactly the correct explanation of the dark energy mechanism is. And so this looks, you know, tough. You can't really appeal to the target-driven logic for a lot of experiments that you might want to run about dark energy. Um, but it doesn't mean that scientists are completely lost, obviously, right? There's tons of experiments that are still happening on dark energy. And the Dark Energy Task Force wrote a full report about what they should do. And so how are, 
experiments justified, or at least some, not all, but some experiments justified in these kinds of situations. I submit that this sometimes happens to what I call a method-driven logic. So let me go through its structure. So given a target system T, method one uses feature A of T to uncover potential new feature X. Method two uses feature B of T to uncover potential new feature X. Method three uses feature C of T to uncover, uncover potential new feature X. The first four premises are very similar to a target-driven one, except that the first one now no longer lists explicitly known features of the target, right? And that means that the rest of the structure has to be different. Particularly, we continue with, um, if T has feature A, method one can be used to uncover new feature X. If T has feature B, method two can be used to uncover new feature X. If T has feature C, method three can be used to uncover new feature X. So we're now confronted with these conditionals. And then the question is, which one of these antecedents can you trigger plausibly? Um, and so for that, we have a final premise. If it is possible and plausible, and or plausible, that T has features A and B, but it is either impossible or implausible, possible that T has feature C. And then we get the conclusion, the preferred methods to uncover potential new feature X will be methods one and two, while method three remains out of consideration for now. Okay, so that's the structure. So what is peculiar about this method-driven logic, or what I call a method-driven logic? Unlike for the target-driven logic, um, the justification of method choice now primarily appeals to what features the target would need to have in order for various methods to be effective without actually knowing whether or not the target has these features, right? And so using the method-driven logic in a responsible manner requires that the assumptions are plausible and at the very least possible for the target to have. But it doesn't require that you actually have sufficient empirical evidence to assume these like features as given or as confirmed about the target. So how can you make these assumptions plausible? Um, for that, I think uh, the pre-existing description of the target is actually uh, still important and still plays a role in context of the method-driven logic. And I'll give an example very shortly. But um, Quite often, what you see when the method-driven logic gets employed, I think, is that scientists can give arguments where they're like, well, it would make our theory simpler. It, um, they appeal to notions like naturalness, although I know some people think these actually confirm things. Um, I'm not sure on that front. Uh, they, they appeal to things like uh, arguments from analogy, for example, that would make it seem plausible or, or at least like nice if a target would have that feature without actually having empirical confirmation for it, right? But at the very minimum, you know, even if you can't construct these plausibility arguments, it is crucial that your assumptions about the target still fall within the space of possibilities for your target, so that they're at the very minimum compatible with the very thin description of your target that you have in the first premise. Okay, so I think this method-driven logic is quite, is somewhat prevalent. Um, here's some examples where I think it applies, dark matter particle searches dark energy, light pulse atom interferometry experiments, um, which are pretty recent, very cool. Uh, cold fusion experiments, um, these are actually a misapplication of a target driven logic from the 1980s, Ponce and Fleischmann, if people are familiar with it. Um, and recently also dumb hole searches for Hawking radiation. Um, but of course, since this is a workshop on evidence in astrophysics, I'll focus on the first one and uh, for the remainder of the talk to fully illustrate this sort of method driven logic and its implications. So let's go to the dark matter searches. So first we need to have a target. Um, and that definition comes unsurprisingly from cosmology and astrophysics. And the cosmological and astrophysical case for the existence of dark matter is pretty strong. I won't go for to the, through the details too much because I think Jaco will tell us all about how dark matter came to matter. Um, and so I'll leave that to him, right? Um, so, but just to give you some, you know, some background, I guess. Um, so recall the pie chart now in a slightly more scientifically um, justified form, you know, or responsible form. So dark matter constitutes 26% approximately uh, of the energy density of the universe today. And um, this is a very thin description about what dark matter is. It's a form of non-baryonic matter that acts gravitationally, right? And for which there are strong upper limits on various possible couplings to standard model particles, including through the strong and electromagnetic interaction, as well as on its self-interaction cross-section. Um, 
where does that definition, like this very rough definition sort of come from? Or what is the evidence for that that like, you know, fed into this definition? There's a lot. Um, it comes from a wide range of scales uh, and from a wide range of sources. So the first evidence for dark matter already arose in the 1930s when Fritz Zwicky um, made observations of velocity dispersion in the coma cluster and proposed dark matter as an explanation for what he observed. Um, but the arguably like the most widely accepted evidence for dark matter came in the 1970s when uh, Vera Rubin observed galaxy rotation curves and plotted galaxy rotation curves. Um, then uh, more recently, we had the observation of the bullet cluster. And in the title of the bullet cluster, the authors considered this direct empirical evidence for the existence of dark matter. That's like the title of the paper. Um, and uh, yeah, I won't go through the details of it, but since I, know, I think most of you are very familiar with it already. Uh, but yeah, so we have the bullet cluster. Then, so that's cluster scales and galaxy scales, but then of course there's cosmological structure formation and uh, the cosmic microwave background power spectrum as well. And so all of these sort of feed into this definition of dark matter, um, but of course that definition is remarkably thin. It tells us that dark matter has gravitational effects, but apart from that, it mostly tells us what it's not, right? And um, this is where the story gets interesting. Because what particle, I mean, not that it's not interesting before, but for the purposes of the talk, <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting. Um, but for the purposes of the talk, particle physicists are entirely interested in the features that this definition does not talk about, right? They're interested in how dark matter might couple through standard model particles through interactions other than the gravitational one, say. And so this definition doesn't even tell us whether there is such a coupling in the first place, right? It might well be that dark matter is just hanging out by itself and like not talking to, sta talking to standard model particles. But it does play an important role in particle phys physics uh, searches for dark matter. First of all, it delineates a space of possibilities due to the very strong upper limits, right? Here's an, another XKCD very responsible uh, example of the space of possibilities. Um, I don't think that space cows are still allowed, but I might be wrong. Um, but basically, um, it does delineate a little bit like the space of possibilities for dark matter particles. Um, for example, ordinary neutrinos have been ruled out because of structure formation. Um, but it also, as will become clear, gives us some idea about what features dark matter might plausibly have. And then I think space cows are pretty implausible. Okay, so let me give you an example, like let me now go through how the particle physicists um, justify their experiment. So a first kind of, or like class of experiments that I wanna look at um, is, uh, are called so-called direct detection experiments. They've been around since the 1980s, 1990s. And they continue to be one of the main players in looking for uh, dark matter. Okay, so um, here's a Feynman diagram. Uh, the black blob in the middle basically indicates that we're dealing with effective theory, so it can be resolved in various ways. Um, but the different arrows here, you know, the ones that are going like that, indicate the direction of time. And so for different kinds of dark matter searches, you have to read the diagram differently. And so for direct detection experiments, we read it from bottom the top, where chi indicates a dark matter particle and F is a standard model particle. And so basically you have a dark matter particle scattering off of a standard model particle and then again continuing along its way and um, the standard model particle also continuing. So the outcome is also a dark, uh, standard model particle. Um, and so the hope is that in a scattering event, a dark matter particle will deposit um, some momentum or energy and you know that can be detected in various ways, which I'll go in detail for a bit. A disclaimer, um, for the rest of my discussion of this uh, case of dark matter, I'm gonna focus on WIMPs, um, and I'm just gonna leave out all of the other candidates, which I know there's plenty of, um, out of consideration. So how were these production experiments justified? Again, I'm gonna give you the general structure first, and then give some details on each of the premises. So, given dark matter as described by astrophysics and cosmology, uh, you know, which I did in the previous subsection. How do these, uh, then we have the discussion of the method, right? And it refers here to neutrino detection experiments. And so neutrino detection experiments use the weak coupling of neutrinos with an extraterrestrial origin to detect their presence by their deposited energy in scattering events of neutrinos from atomic nuclei. Um, then we have the uh, sort of the conditional statement. 
if dark matter particles are weakly interacting, have a mass of the order of 100 GeV, and uh, exist stably in the galactic halo, detectors similar to those uh, f used for neutrino detection can be used to search for signatures of dark matter particles existing in the halo of the Milky Way. Based on astrophysical evidence and the WIMP miracle, it is possible that dark matter particles are weakly interacting, have a mass of the order of 100 GeV, and exist stably in the galactic halo. Therefore, detectors similar to those used under the neutri for neutrino detection sorry, can be used to search for signatures of dark matter particles existing in the halo of the Milky Way. So let's go through each premise. The first premise just refers to what I described earlier, right? The thin de definition of dark matter based on astrophysical and cosmological evidence. The second, question, uh, second premise describes, as I said, the method. And it refers to neutrino detection experiments. So what are these uh, neutrino detection experiments that are being described? Here's a picture of Super Cameo Candy in Japan. And this is the successor of the Cameo Candy detector that was constructed in the 1980s. Cameo Candy was actually constructed to detect uh, proton decay, but um, one of its main successes was that it actually showed uh, that it actually succeeded in detecting solar neutrinos, and it basically established that the sun is a source of solar neutrinos. How did they do that? Well, it's basically a giant vat of super pure water, right? You should see here there's humans in a boat for scale. Um, and when a solar neutrino comes in, it'll scatter off of one of the particles in the detector fluid, and that in turn will lead to a signal that can be detected with all of these detectors you want involved, right? Next, there's the conditional. This is where the neutrino method basically gets extended to dark matter searches, but where certain assumptions need to be made about the properties of dark matter to justify the effectiveness of these searches. And so here's some papers from the 1980s that argued that neutrino detection experiments could be used for dark matter. So for example, Goodman and Witten wrote that dark galactic halos, uh, in 1985, wrote dark galactic halos may be clouds of elementary particles so weakly interacting or so few and massive that they are not conspicuous. Recently, Druki and Sudolsky proposed a new way of detecting solar and reactor neutrinos. The idea is to exploit elastic neutral current scattering of nuclei by neutrinos and the principle of such a detector has already been demonstrated. In this paper, we will calculate the sensitivity of the detector to various dark matter candidates. Similarly, around the same time, Wasserman in a different paper wrote, recently a new type of neutrino detector, which relies on the idea that even small neutrino energy losses in cold material with a small specific heat could produce measurable temperature changes, has been proposed. The purpose of this paper is to examine the possibility that such a detector can be used to observe heavy neutral fermions in the galaxy. Such particles, it has been suggested, could be a substantial component of the cosmological missing mass and would be expected to condense gravitationally, in particular, into galactic halos. And so in both cases, these are both paragraphs from the start, from like the introductions to these papers, but you immediately see that the explicit parallel between neutrino detection techniques and dark matter detection techniques is made, right? So they're like, okay, we already know how we could detect neutrinos. Can we make assumptions about dark matter so that we can use these same kinds of techniques to look for dark matter particles? Um, and so the question is, can you make these assumptions that were required possible or plausible? Well, yeah. That's the final uh, premise. Based on astrophysical evidence and the WIMP miracle, it is plausible that dark matter particles have all these features that are required. So um, first, um, they already, uh, yeah, before I go into the WIMP miracle, let me just say uh, one thing that is not assumed is that neutrinos constitute dark matter because there was already evidence from structure formation that neutrinos could not constitute dark matter. So here's a quote, I won't read through it entirely, but from a review article from Primax, Sackle, and Sattelay in 1988, where they like survey direct detection techniques and the different candidates for dark matter in 1988. And they already suggest that like, based on structure formation, neutrinos are excluded. So even with the very thin description available at the time, they could already exclude some uh, possible candidates. And so they could already delineate, delineate the space of possibilities. But apart from that, there's also, um, the fact that it wasn't just excluding possible candidates, but also considering other candidates as more plausible. And for that, um, the WIMPs were considered very plausible candidates because of this cool thing called the WIMP miracle. I think it's one of the best names in astrophysics. Um, so the WIMP miracle, which is basically this, um, oh, that's a bad quality picture, sorry. Um, 
by this graph from Colvin Turner from their textbook from 1990. Um, says that if you introduce WIMPs, you know, weakly interacting massive particles, in the standard scenario for Big Bang nucleosynthesis, you'll automatically end up with the right abundance um, for dark matter, as is predicted based on the cosmological evidence. And even though I don't think anyone would consider this as sufficient evidence confirming that dark matter is constituted by WIMPs, it, is, it would be very nice, right, if um, it makes it at least plausible that dark matter would be constituted by WIMPs. Um, even though it doesn't provide conclusive evidence. And so based on the WIMP miracle um, and all of the previous information, we end up with a conclusion that detectors similar to those used for neutrino detectors can be used to search for signatures of dark matter particles. Um, or, in the words of, the, of Primex Sekul and Sadele, the exciting possibility exists of detecting WIMPs in the laboratory. laboratory. Okay, so hopefully this sort of gives you an idea about how I think this um, method-driven logic functions and how it works in action. Um, but before I conclude, I want to say just a quick thing, again, about this Feynman diagram, right? Because I just talked about the direct detection experiments, but there's also production and indirect detection experiments, which read this Feynman diagram in a different direction. And production experiments, those are the ones that are, for example, run at the LHC, right, where they try to, um, uh, in a collision of two standard model particles, uh, the hope is to either produce, you know, to produce dark matter particles, possibly, or to produce a mediator particle that would basically exist in that blob that could couple two standard model particles, uh, two dark matter particles, um, potentially. Um, and I don't want to go into too much detail for the purpose of time, but um, I do want to raise or like raise a red flag. I don't know whether it's a red flag. Flag something. Um, namely that these production experiments, I think, are also constituted by this, or like justified through this kind of method-driven logic. But the kinds of assumptions that they make about dark matter particles are different than the ones that are being made in the case of the direct detection searches, right? Um, because here, the main assumption is that uh, the coupling of, um, uh, is, is about the coupling of dark matter particles to standard model particles. And it's something like either it's made up of supersymmetric particles, that's one kind of searches that is arguably looking for dark matter at the LHC, or um, it's coupling through a particular kind of mediator particle, be it invisible Higgs or others, there are other candidates. Um, and so basically, these different assumptions also mean that the resulting evidence coming out of these production experiments takes a different form than out of the direct detection experiments. Right, they're constraining different sets of parameters and comparing the two with one another is uh, a non-trivial exercise. So, um, where have we ended up? Let me conclude. Uh, so, I've proposed that there are two logics at work in justifying method choices, a target-driven logic and method-driven logic. Um, the target-driven logic appeals to pre-established knowledge of the target um, to argue that a particular method will be effective. Uh, the method-driven logic appeals to what features the target would need to have in order for an existing method to be uh, effective in investigating something about the target. And I've illustrated this method-driven logic via the example of dark matter. Um, but just to end, there's, and this is like very much work in progress, there's a couple of questions that sort of arise out of this method-driven logic. Um, first, what can you conclude if you get a positive or a negative result? And um, uh, what, my, what I think is the case, but I might be wrong, is that in a negative result, it's quite clear what you learn about the target. It basically excludes what cannot be the case about the target, because if your assumption about the target had been true, you would have been able to find something, uh, you know, you'd find something in your experiment. But for a positive result, it's a little bit harder how to interpret the results because there's this assumption about the target that's lingering in the background. And of course, the question is, you know, can you find independent evidence, right? Can you do a sort of robustness analysis from these different, like where you use different assumptions like production and direct detection and indirect detection experiments? But um, of course, that still brings up the question, how can you compare the results from the different methods, given that they actually modify your description of the target in various different ways? So those are sort of like questions that I'm still pondering. But thank you. There we go. <laughs> so some time for questions.
questions? Um, target driven questions? Yeah. Method driven questions? If you have both available, target driven and method driven, mm -hmm. or any particular um, experimental observation study of the features of our system, do you think that the target driven should be preferred? because of the counterfactual conditions in the method driven? I'm not or? sure, because I think in that case, I mean, because, you know, maybe you can run a target driven experiment, but where you know your method is like a ton of systematics that you find incredibly hard to control for, and that you don't, you don't, you don't really know how to control for. And suppose you can run a method driven experiment where you do make that conditional assumption, but you know, like, you know the systematics really well, you can put very good, you know, limits on those. Um, maybe the method-driven logic can give you some sort of further direction to then right. find independent evidence for the assumption or things like that. So I think that sort of depends on. You so ta target-driven doesn't always trump. No, uh, method -driven. I don't. I don't think so. Right. I, yeah. No. <laughs> so how much depends it also? I mean, I was wondering on the psychology or sociology of the experimental group. I mean, yeah. on the biases, because it seems, it seems, I mean, very open to that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's sort of the thing of like, well, my advisor works on this kind of type of experiment, so I'm working on this type of experiment and applying it elsewhere. I mean, I think, fair enough, I think in practice, that could play a role. But at the same time, even if those biases in practice are going to like prompt you, to run a particular kind of experiment, I still think that there's this rational justification that also needs to be in play for you to be able to actually think that that experiment is going to be successful, right? If your if your advisor, you know, again the example of like optical microscopy or something like that, right? You're not nobody whose advisor works on optical like, microscopy is gonna. I mean, I say advisor, or like nobody who works on optical microscopy is gonna be like, I'm gonna look for dark matter with my optical microscope. Um, because there's, you can't give this kind of rational justification for it. So I think you're right that in practice, the psychology and the sociology might influence whether or not somebody's even trying to construct this kind of rational justification that I've given. But I do think that the rational justification still has to be there to actually run the experiment. Does that help? Yes, yes. Of course, I mean, also the, the thing is, um, for example, with the gravitation wave experiments, I remember that in the sort of earlier times, I mean, they didn't even know for what to look. I mean, so, I mean, in, in a way, you also sometimes you have to take a big risk um, because you don't really know what, I mean, the signal that you're looking for. So how yeah. does this fit into that? Yeah, I think that's true, but I think um, sometimes, yeah, it's very unclear and the space of possibilities is just incredibly vast, right, on what you're looking for. So I think in some cases, um, and, and for example, the WIMP case actually gives a good sort of example here. Um, I talked about WIMPs as if it's like a very well-defined thing. It's not, right? There's a, like the WIMP class of particles is still very broad, and so I think part might be there that the assumption you're making about your target is try to make it as minimal, minimal as possible, right? Um, so that you can like um, survey a wide range of the space of possible possibilities, for example. I haven't looked at the gravitational wave case, so I don't, I can't say something conclusive about it, but um, yeah, just like in the dark matter case, for example, mm. I think that's sort of what's happening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Super interesting. So what do you think the fact that this super Kamiokande was designed to uh, to de to detect kind of the to measure the proton decay and ended up discovering the solar neutrino tells us about the virtues of the method driven method versus the kind of target driven because that was a method driven experiment right but they actually ended up discovering something they were not intending initially to discover. Yeah, um, I think okay mm, again I'm so. Mm. I haven't looked at the, at the history of Super Cameo Candy in detail itself, but um, I don't think that uh, the, the construction of Super Cameo Candy was, uh, I think, target-driven, right? They knew what they were looking for, finding the proton decay. Of course, yeah, you can be lucky and find something completely different like happened in that case. 
I'm not sure whether that says anything about um, the justification of the experiment. Like, I th yeah, because I think that was sort of, sort of accidentally that happened. Um, and probably in retrospect, you could probably construct, you know, sort of like retrospectively, a target-driven logic as to why Super Cameo Candy was able to find it. Um, but uh, what, I'm, what I'm describing here is like just justification before you construct an experiment. And yeah, that allows for the possibility that you might get lucky and find something that you didn't expect to. Um, but even if you do, then I think retrospectively, probably one of those two will allow you to sort of construct why you were able to find it. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, do you think that with any of the two methods, methods it will be possible to say in the future that uh, from the negative point of view, I mean, if there are no detections that, uh, for example, WIMS do not exist or um, modify gravity is favor in this sense, because, I mean, you are restricting the possibilities, and I don't know if will be possible in the future to um, say something positive about that. About the, the like, to, to rule out the, yeah. the existence of WIMS? Well, in principle, if you rule out all of the space of possibilities, then um, yes, of course, in the WIMP case, it's kind of interesting, right? Because we're now, sort of, the experiments are getting, like, the constraints on the existence of WIMS are getting stronger and stronger, right? Or on the features of WIMS. Um, because there's a ton of direct detection experiments and they're all not giving anything. Um, so, I mean, I think in science it's hard to ever say that you completely ruled out a possibility because there's always technical, technological limitations. And, uh, yeah, so I don't think that there will be like a principle like we are absolutely sure now uh, that there are no whims. But um, I do think that there's sort of the common understanding that slowly time is running out. I think like Kolb at some point said something like, um, it like it's like we're in the fourth quarter of a football game and um, you know we're not quite there, but the clock is almost run out for Wims. Um, just at which point like technological limitations like the neutrino floor just prevent you from finding anything like from, from actually being able to find conclusive evidence for Wims. Um, and where other candidates just become like more practically like possible to find, right? Where it might might just like not be feasible given the cost to construct another wind detector and to be like, well maybe we should look elsewhere, maybe we should move grass or something like that. Um, but yeah, so I think there's practical limitations. there's always gonna be like the technological limitations to making such a principal decision. Um, as far as were you talking about were you meaning Mond or uh, when you mentioned modified gravity? Yeah. I think that's a whole other beast that I don't really want to get into today, but I don't think that if we exclude a WIMS that that automatically means that mod is right. Um, yeah. There's a whole other set of reasons for that, I would say. Yeah. Further questions? Comments? I have a question about the... Uh, difference between target driven mm -hmm. and method driven mm -hmm. and uh, whether because it sounds when you describe target driven that we have a complete accurate knowledge of the target right, right. that we rely on in order to distinguish the features and whether or not the method applies but it's typically the case that what we have is a pretty good model mm -hmm. of the target which as any model could uh, be excluding some variables of interest that we haven't discovered yet. The uh, target is typically just described up to a certain level of accuracy and so on. Mm. So if you take that all that into account, does that in some way diminish the validity of the distinction or does it mean that they're just both kinds of the same more general method? Or how would you go about carefully right. distinguishing them when you rely on models? So I think um, you're absolutely right. And in my general description of it, I said like with known features, 
Um, what I mean by known features is, um, you know, theory or like the best, according to the best scientific model that we have today and that has been confirmed by empirical evidence. And so, in that sense, I do think that there's quite a harsh distinction between the two in that, say, in the, neut in the neutron lifetime experiments, um, you know, there's a lot of independent evidence that is already confirming our existing model of the neutron and that we can then look at like, oh, what kind of, kind of methods can we use for the neutron? Or say, um, in molecular biology where they're trying to determine like a protein folding structure, that's like the Mitchell and Gronenborg example. Um, there, it's just like, well, we know proteins are made up of atoms, so we mm. can look at atoms through X-ray crystallography or nuclear magnetic resonance, right? And um, I mean that that the fact that proteins are made up of atoms, like that's just like a I mean, it's our best scientific model, and it's ignoring a lot of other things about proteins. But it is something that we have independent empirical evidence for and independent reasons to believe. Whereas if you look at the dark matter case. Um, there's, there's no well-established mm -hmm. model of the non-gravitational interaction of dark matter particles um, that you know is providing like the background for how these experiments are justified, and the same for like the other four cases that I listed. Um, so I do actually think that there's quite a, a hard distinction. I'm not, yeah, yeah, that there is pretty clear distinction in some cases, even though some might be more at the edge. Fair enough, but. I think there's definitely sort of extreme. I mean, it's quite clear that the method driven can be applied when you don't even have a, met a model of the target and you have no um, idea. You can just yeah. apply the conditional and just sure. use the detector that you have available and you get some kind of result out yeah. of that, but it may be incredibly but the interpretation tentative, might be really right? Hard. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah right. definitely.